In the 1980s, Catherine Sposito went to Brooklyn, New York, high school. After graduating from high school, she moved to Prescott, Arizona to attend Prescott College. She had made lots of friends in her new community. She was an enthusiastic hiker and a passionate artist. Kathy, at 23 years old, went out to supper with her pals on June 12, 1987. She informed them she was heading out for a morning hike. Kathy started her hike up the path at roughly 7 a.m. on June 13 after riding her mountain bike to the trailhead. The route is located around 10 minutes outside of Prescott's downtown, in an area of the Prescott National Forest. In the vicinity, hiking is very popular there. Shortly after Kathy left, a woman screaming for assistance was heard by other hikers. Because of the dense terrain, it took some time for the other hikers to find the woman who was in need. It was too late by the time they got there. Kathy's lifeless body was eventually identified as their horrifying discovery. A hiker dialed the police number. Kathy's killing shook the whole Prescott City in Yavapai County, since the Booter Trail was always thought to be secure. According to the post-mortem, Kathy's death was caused by blunt force injuries to the right side of the head. Two boulders and a ratchet wrench that were discovered at the crime scene led to this. Additionally, Kathy was hit in the face by a 22 caliber bullet that entered her eye. Her brain was not struck by the bullet. Her side of the head also had a stab wound. The knife and sharp object that were used to stab her have disappeared. In the course of looking for the culprit, the police began their investigation. It was quite challenging because there weren't many hints and no witnesses. Investigators have stated over the years that there might be multiple offenders. According to Yavapai Sheriff David Rhodes, you have to keep all doors open, and my team could be closer than ever to finding answers. If the case is solved, DNA will undoubtedly have played a role. Novelties in DNA testing, such as familial DNA, may blow this case wide open. An organization in Yavapai County, Arizona, called Yavapai Silent Witness, was offering a $10,000 incentive to encourage the exchange of confidential information that leads to the resolution of crimes. Sal Spazito, Kathy's older brother, traveled from New York to the crime scene, along with detectives. He asked anyone with information to come forward. Kathy's high school classmate sent an email to other graduates. I'm releasing this message here in the hopes of inspiring prayers and finding closure for one of our departed friends, Kathy Sposito. Please pardon the heartbreaking tone. As you may remember from previous conversations held here, in 1987, Kathy was brutally murdered. The case remained unsolved forever. The previous weekend, the graduate and her spouse had made a trip to Prescott. She wrote that she had been thinking about Kathy when she was in Prescott. The classmate recognized that the police were still looking for her culprits when she saw the big poster of Kathy's picture in the window as the pair headed out of one of the downtown businesses. After they spoke, the shopkeeper informed her that there were some fresh leads that had surfaced, which gave her hope for a resolution to the case. The alumni were pleased to see that Kathy's memory and the pursuit of justice endured after seeing the identical poster and other local windows all throughout the town. She concluded her email by saying, I felt like you should know about it and pray for Kathy and this case. Sheriff Rhodes declared in 2021 that although many individuals had moved on with their lives in the intervening 34 years, our detectives and cold case investigators had not forgotten what had happened to Kathy. This case is being actively investigated. We are aware that someone is knowledgeable about Kathy's circumstances. All we can hope for is that they act honorably and come forward. In 2021, during an interview, Kathy's brother stated that hope should never be lost. He thought back to the day he found out the terrible news. It was unexpected, something that no one desires to experience. There was no incident here. Someone who was really angry and furious decided to end her life. Sal Sposito stated 
that their father passed away in 2010 without any answers, and their mother passed away a few years after that. He continued, I always said our mother passed away due to a broken heart because of what happened to Kathy. She took it the worst, as he concluded the conversation. Finally, on August 25, 2023, Sheriff David Rhodes declared at a press conference that the culprit in Kathy Sposito case had been identified as Brian Scott Bennett based on DNA evidence. Sheriff Rhodes reported to the media, I can declare with absolute certainty that Brian Scott Bennett killed Kathy. Years later, in 1994, the serial predator who had victimized her committed suicide. Bennett would have turned 53 today. Kathy was killed when he was a junior in high school at Prescott. He had migrated from Calvin, Kentucky to Prescott when he was just 16 years old. He was only a student there for a year and a half before leaving Prescott High School in 1988. He served in the Army briefly after graduation before deserting in 1989. Bennett was sentenced to three years of probation after being found guilty of forgery in 1991. The sheriff's office claims that he was found not convicted for any violent offenses. After completing his prison sentence in Arizona for the forgery, Bennett fled the country in 1993. Bennett's first victim, according to the investigators, was Kathy. Authorities currently think he was also responsible for the 1990 attack on a different woman who was in her 30s at the time. It took place at the same time of day on the same trail. She went for a trek while camping with her boyfriend in April 1990. In a matter of minutes, Bennett ambushed her by sneaking up from behind and threatening to kill her with a rock. He ran into the woods after attacking her. For privacy concerns, the woman's name is being kept anonymous, but she lived. Sheriff Rhodes carried on with the news conference, stating that investigators had finally located a Bennett family member thanks to a DNA sample taken from the second attack on the same hiking trail. This was in 2017, when detectives were able to connect the DNA results to the second attack thanks to more sophisticated and easily accessible DNA technologies. They proceeded to Kathy's case by going backwards. Sheriff Rhodes said the DNA was sent to labs, and after a family tree analysis, a female descendant and Bennett were identified. Their research took them first to Bennett and then to Kentucky. In November 2022, officials excavated Bennett's body to collect a complete DNA profile, which they positively matched to the DNA profiles from the two attacks on the hiking trail in order to rule out a family. The forensic study of the family continues. Using cheek swabs from Bennett's brother and Bennett's daughter, DNA was recovered. Investigators didn't discover Bennett's DNA on the ranch where Kathy was killed until March 2023. He was charged with beating two more women, one of whom allegedly occurred at a Chino Valley party in July 1990. After allegedly drinking, the victim went to lie down in a bedroom. Bennett attempted to assault the victim after following her into the room, though. After witnesses managed to smash through the door, Bennett fled. Later, the Chino Valley Police Department placed him under arrest. However, because of contradicting testimony from eyewitnesses, he was found not guilty. According to Sheriff Rhodes, Renee Sandoval is Bennett's fourth victim. As she was leaving the Prescott Post Office on June 2, 1993, Bennett pushed her into her car at knife point and repeatedly attacked her. Eventually, the car was pulled over by a policeman for not dimming the headlights. Renee Sandoval managed to get away as a result. She thought he was going to take her life. He'd told her, you've seen my face, so I can't let you go. Bennett was detained once more, but was never found guilty because of inconsistencies in the testimony and a lack of proof. During Friday's news conference, Renee Sandoval, who was 22 at the time of the kidnapping and abuse, gave a statement. This has been a long time coming, she replied, beaming. I prayed that night, and I want to begin by thanking God and giving you all the honor for being with me. He spoke to me. 
I am here today because of him. She urged everyone in attendance to offer prayers for all of the victims of crimes like this. Offer prayers for those who were voiceless. And today she is free. You are free, Kathy. Numerous emotions exist. You cannot ask me. I can't really express it. Sandoval came to the conclusion that everyone, including the elderly, should be aware of their surroundings, especially the young people. That's something I always tell my mom and my grandchildren. Through new DNA research, cold case detectives were able to connect the four distinct victims, Kathy, Renee Sandoval, and the other two. According to Rhodes, the fact that Bennett won't face trial in these cases doesn't make them any less important. During Friday's press conference, Rhodes also questioned how such a terrible and horrible thing could occur in such a beautiful place. Authorities intended to find out if there were more victims besides Kathy and the three other ladies by making this news public. According to Rhodes, authorities think the suspect may have been connected to more than four victims. He went on, What we know about serious violent predators like this is that it is highly unlikely that these four cases are the only ones that exist, considering how frequently he was willing to act. Sheriff Rhodes added, We are giving voice back to the survivors, which is exactly what happened in this situation. The survivors are getting their replies back from you. You're responding to the community with answers. Thanks to the efforts of countless detectives, committed volunteers, and partners who devoted their time and hearts to cracking these cold cases. Today, four ladies receive validation or a piece of closure. Attending the news briefing, Prescott Mayor Phil Goody stated that with the availability of such information these days, advances in DNA, both direct and familial, allow for closure for all those involved in cold cases like Kathy Sposito. It's likely that you'll receive a knock on your door indicating that justice has been done. Kerry Ann Cummings, a transient from Eureka, California, was 25 years old. She suffered from mental illness. Kerry was admitted to a mental health facility in 1997, but chose not to receive additional treatment. Even though her family pleaded with her to see them, she refused to return home. She rather opted to couch surf in Eugene, Oregon, and told her family about it. They didn't hear from her again after that. Kerry's parents made an effort to get in touch with her and reported her missing to the police. They also employed a private detective. She was dearly loved by the whole family. Kerry's sister, Kathy, stated that they were informed that Kerry was an adult who had chosen her lifestyle and that there was nothing they could do to stop her if she posed no threat to herself or others. Regarding her years-long search for her sister, she also shared the following. When I was missing her, I started looking through Jane Doe's photos on the NamUs website and checking for any mention of her tattoo as the internet grew. One year after Kerry Ann disappeared in November 1998, Wayne Adam Ford visited a Eureka, California police station holding a Bible in one hand and a plastic bag containing a woman's body parts in the other. He admitted to killing four ladies, although he was unaware of their identities. He named three of his victims. Tina Renee Gibbs, who is 26 years old and was born on April 20, 1972. On May 16, 1998, she was killed close to Las Vegas. Her body was discovered in the vicinity of Buttonwillow, California, on June 2. 25-year-old Fontana resident Lynette Dion White was executed in Ontario, California, on September 25, 1998. Her body was later disposed of in an irrigation canal close to Lodi. Thomas Patricia Ann, she was 29 years old when she was killed in Hesperia, and on October 23, 1998, her body was discovered in a San Bernardino aqueduct. One woman, though, remained unidentified. Through Ford's interrogation, investigators were able to get detailed information about the woman. As part of the inquiry, Ford's encampment was also examined and other body parts were discovered. 
Through the use of DNA, the detectives were able to connect the body part that Ford had brought in with a body that had been discovered by duck hunters north of Eureka in October 1997 of the previous year, as well as with additional remains that had been discovered by officials. In his campground and on Clam Beach in January 1998, nine months earlier, Despite running DNA samples through the National Unidentified Persons DNA Index and the California Missing Persons DNA Database, no profile matches were ever found. Eight years later, in June 2006, Ford received a life sentence, which he is presently serving at California's San Quentin State Prison. Given that the investigators are aware of the identity of the perpetrator, but not the victim, this is a very unique case. A cold case section was established by Sheriff William Honsall in 2021 with the express purpose of looking for fresh leads in the unresolved cases of the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office. They collaborated with Othram, a forensic genealogy lab, in December 2022 to see if cutting-edge forensic DNA testing could provide light on the identity of the unidentified female or a close relative. The company was able to construct a family tree and use forensic genome sequencing to develop a profile of someone they believed might be a close relative. Finally, they discovered a match to a close cousin of the unidentified woman. When the relative got in touch with the police, she revealed that she had a family member who died in the late 1990s. She then connected them to Kerry Ann Cummings, the missing person's sister Kathy. Investigators compared a DNA sample from Kathy with the sample from the unidentified female's remains. In 2023, they were able to identify the missing woman at last, 25 years later. Regarding her sister, Kathy had the following to say. Kerry was an artist, intelligent, humorous, and gorgeous. She had a tremendous ability to make us laugh. What mental illness can do in only two short years? is catastrophic. Sheriff William Hansel praised his team and stated, We hope that this identification can help bring closure to Kerry's family and the community, even though we cannot take away the pain of loss. I am thankful of our detectives' commitment, as they never gave up on Kerry and kept looking for answers in the unsolved cases. Kerry's remains are currently being released by the Humboldt County Coroner's Office so that she can be buried with her family. It was November 15, 2015, a Sunday morning, when a family living on Farley Lane near Lillian in Baldwin County, Alabama stumbled upon a shocking discovery on their private road. In the rear seat of an automobile parked outside, they discovered the body of Devon Deshaun Kennedy, a resident of Pensacola, Florida. He'd been shot to death. The investigation into this heinous crime was undertaken by the diligent Baldwin County Sheriff's Office investigators. At that time, they had identified a few individuals as persons of interest. However, Lieutenant Andrew Ashton of the Baldwin County Sheriff's Office explained that, unfortunately, there was insufficient evidence to directly link these individuals to the charges. On the other hand, Dismissing them as suspects outright was also not an option. The turning point in this case came on April 19, 2023, when 32-year-old Deckardy Darnell Herring was taken into custody and accused of the murder of Devon Deshaun Kennedy. Two days later, on April 21, 2023, Herring made his initial court appearance. During this appearance, he revealed that he had been serving a seven-year sentence due to a federal firearms charge. As he was nearing the end of his sentence, Baldwin County detectives named him as their prime suspect. Lieutenant Andrew Ashton explained that Herring had been released from jail but had to go through legal proceedings in Escambia County before being handed over to authorities in Alabama. It is believed that Deshaun and Herring knew each other and robbery was the likely motive for the crime. There is also evidence indicating that the shooting may have occurred at a different location. The arrest of Deckardy Darnell Herring was a significant moment for Lieutenant Ashton, 
who had been the lead detective on this case in 2015. He noted that it brought some relief to the victim's family after years of uncertainty. He expressed hope that more information would emerge as time went on. During Herring's court hearing, District Judge Bill Scully set his bond at $150,000. Should Herring make bond, he will be required to wear a GPS ankle monitor and will be prohibited from leaving the state. If you have any information regarding this case, please do not hesitate to contact Lt. Andy Ashton at 251-972-6872. The pursuit of justice continues, and any leads could prove invaluable in bringing closure to this tragic case. On the evening of June 22, 2019, a tragic incident unfolded on Winship Street in Hartford, Connecticut. Reports of gunfire led officers to the scene, where they discovered a man in his 30s who had been shot. He was rushed to Hartford Hospital for a life-saving operation, and fortunately, he has since recovered from his injuries. Tragically, in an adjacent car, another man, identified as Eros Diaz, a 24-year-old resident of Avon, Connecticut, had lost his life due to gunshot wounds. Eros's family offered a substantial reward for information leading to an arrest and conviction in the case. After a lengthy investigation, a 35-year-old Hartford geneticist, McMahon, was named as a suspect in the shooting. On June 13, 2023, McMahon was apprehended and charged with the murder of Eros Diaz. It was revealed that both McMahon and Eros had a history of using illegal narcotics, although the exact motive behind the incident remains undisclosed. McMahon is currently being held on a $3 million bail and is scheduled to appear in Hartford Superior Court on July 10, 2023. Witnesses came forward, placing McMahon at the crime scene and providing crucial DNA evidence found on a hat nearby. According to the affidavit, on the fateful night of June 22, 2019, at around 9.30 p.m. Eros Diaz and Xavier Lugo, who was 31 at the time, were shot following an automobile accident in the vicinity of 25 Winship Street. Tragically, Eros Diaz lost his life at the scene after being shot in the head, while Lugo, who was found approximately a block away, was initially in critical condition after sustaining multiple gunshot wounds. Eros's mother, Catherine Diaz, expressed her relief and hope for justice. She mentioned that they had never lost faith in seeing the person responsible for her son's attack held accountable. She hopes that by taking the offender from the streets, other mothers and families can be spared the heartbreak of losing a loved one. Catherine Diaz also expressed her gratitude to the numerous members of the criminal justice system who tirelessly worked over four years to initiate the healing process for her family. A bystander discovered the body of an unidentified female near Beaumont, California, on January 27, 1996. The discovery was made close to Gilman Springs Road in a remote, hilly region in a ravine south of the eastbound Highway 60. A law enforcement officer was alerted to the body by a couple who were passing by and told him about it. When investigators got to the area, they thought that she had been killed a few hours before. The victim appeared to be of Asian or Hispanic American Indian descent and had suffered a gunshot wound to her head with signs of abuse. She was found lying on her back without any identification or a handbag. At the time, there were no leads to further the investigation. Her short tandem repeat profile was acquired and added to California's missing and unidentified person database. She was estimated to be between 30 to 45 years old, with brown eyes and hair, standing at 5 feet 1 inch and weighing around 130 pounds. Notably, she had a scar from surgery on her right abdomen. Local agencies were notified about potential missing persons matching her description, and her case was added to NamUs. Detectives 
in an effort to gather leads, used local media and created a composite sketch, but the case eventually went cold as all leads were exhausted and her identity remained a mystery. Recently, Othram and the Riverside County Regional Cold Case Team joined forces to employ forensic genetic genealogy and advanced DNA testing to reinvigorate the investigation. A comprehensive genealogy profile was created using forensic DNA evidence sent to Othram. After returning to law enforcement, the profile was used for genetic genealogy research. Through public databases, including the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System and Genealogy, investigators managed to find the four daughters of the victim. Juana Rosa Zagal, a resident of the Los Angeles region, was conclusively identified as the victim by the California Department of Justice Riverside Crime Lab using their missing and unidentified person system. This development was announced on June 26, 2023. At the time of her death, Juana was 41 years old. One of her daughters expressed the impact of the tragedy, saying, he destroyed my family and hoping for information about the case. Investigators believe that Juana's friends, neighbors, or co-workers could shed light on her disappearance. They urge anyone with knowledge or additional information to call 951-955-2777 or 951-955-740 to assist in the ongoing investigation. In June 2020, a tragic discovery was made near Elizabeth, New Jersey, in Union County. An unknown woman's body was found near the 300 block of Port Avenue, close to train tracks. After arriving at the scene, investigators moved the woman's body to allow for an autopsy. It was discovered during the autopsy that the woman had been murdered. This marked the tragic end of her life. The woman's complexion and estimated age range were also established. She was black and likely between the age of 25 and 35. She weighed between 125 and 140 pounds, and her height was estimated to be 5 feet 6 inches. The woman's hair was short and her ears were pierced twice. In the hopes that someone might recognize her, a forensic drawing was made that shows what the woman might have looked like. Nevertheless, despite their best efforts, investigators were unable to identify the woman since they had little clues to follow. She gained recognition as the Union County Jane Doe 2020 when detectives were unable to identify her. The woman's unidentified person case details were added to the national database for unidentified missing persons. Three years after the woman's remains were found, in March 2023, the Union County Prosecutor's Office and Othram Inc. collaborated to see if advanced DNA testing could assist identify the woman or a close relative. The Forensic Laboratory of the Union County Prosecutor's Office sent forensic evidence to the Othram Laboratory located in the Woodlands, Texas. The woman's complete DNA profile was produced by Othram scientists using forensic grade genome sequencing. The DNA profile is used by the Othram Internal Genetic Genealogy Team to generate leads for further investigation that are then forwarded to investigators. Detectives were able to focus their search and identify the victim as Jasmine Featherstone of Elizabeth, New Jersey, thanks to these clues. Jasmine had lived in Middletown, Connecticut, and was 23 years old when she passed away. In June 2023, the identification was made public. Investigators are still looking into the specifics of what happened to Jasmine. We ask anyone with information regarding this case to contact Sergeant Lamar Hartsfield at 908-451-1873, the prosecutor's office in Union County. You can give anonymous tips over the phone at 908,654 tips. You might receive up to $10,000 in compensation if your tip results in an indictment and conviction.